for a start, I want to say that um, Paul says some, say something of, uh, of, of King David, that after he has served God's purposes in his generation, he went to be with the Lord. He went to be with Jesus. He went to be with God the Father uh, before he, he came to this world. We find other, many other men who were, who are, who are referred to, to being of service or being referred to as servants of God, even by God himself. When he says, have you seen, or have you visited, have you seen the things that I have done in Job's uh, house? He says of the same of Abraham, Joshua, and David. He says the same thing of the, the prophets. He say, um, Jesus Christ himself says he had come to serve. He was saying, I'm also a servant. The true disciples of Jesus, the true disciples of Jesus uh, also qualify and say they, are, they served the Lord in their generations. The apostles of Jesus, including the replacement of Judas, as you will see, served their purposes in God's generation. My, desi my desire is that each and every one of us will pray that may, be, may, may we be of service to God and to fellow uh, human beings and to those who belong to the household of God, that he makes us to be like the master. I would like us to give a glimpse of Jesus Christ as he comes to the last 24 hours of serving his generation, so to speak. Before he says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. John uh, 17, verse 6. Before he says, it is finished. I want us to look at that, uh, the, those 24 hours. Let me say that the passage that was read and which we are really reflecting and building uh, our talk today is a memoir of, you know, we have heard from time to time of kitchen cabinets, okay? Those who go into the inner sanctum of certain offices, those who go into the corner office and sit there and are able to converse with those who matter at the top. And that is no other, none other than John, the son of Zebedee. Someone who was nicknamed the son of Danda together with his brother. Because they were, before um, they matured, they would ask, can we have, eh? can we call Tanda? They had known that Jesus had given them the, some authority. Can we call Tanda to finish these people? You know, and the like. This is the man who at the end of this uh, verse, we know he was leaning on Jesus' bosom. He was actually, if, if anything, he was either on the right or on the left. It is likely that he was on the right, and Judas may have been on the left of that seat on that final day. I know you know the others, they must have been 12 um, uh, members. And so, memoirs are not things that we can say we do not know as Kenyans. I know many of us have, in the recent past, read some uh, creeping stories. If you have not read, I think we also watch news. And I just want to, to refer to only one of them. 
Aden Duale, you know, he gave us for the record. And we had the last time they parted with our former president and the way he remained with the present president. The, the, the script that um, my wife, Dorcas, read um, is in a, in, in a way uh, condensed as something to be acted on, you know? I, I was not here when uh, Petro, Petrolina uh, spoke about a cabin love. But I know I revisited a clip, and one thing remains in my mind. When he was demonstrating eh, that Samaritan going, going and kneeling, I don't know where, where she was, it might have been something like this. And um, this is what Jesus did on this final hour, around 3, 3 p.m. Uh, all the way. The time zone of Israel and here, I think, are almost the same, either plus or minus one hour, you know? And so he was doing what Petrolina did. And uh, that, that shows the success of your, of your preaching on that day. Because I, I, I may not remember everything else, but I can see that picture of you. Uh, kneeling and saying, it didn't matter, she didn't have to use um, kiku kikuyu, she didn't have to use, and I don't know how you got all those uh, uh, languages together, including Nandi. Uh, but um, it was a demonstration of what this love is about. And we see that being, uh, being uh, scripted by Paul in Bolivians 2, 1 to 11. When you have time, revisit that, even as you revisit um, John uh, 13, 1 to 17. Let me say that, um, first of all, this food washing uh, demonstration by Jesus Christ at a particular setting. You know, um, I mentioned the time. So it had, it had a specific time. It had a, spe a specific time in Jesus' generation. The feast itself that they were preparing to commemorate was so significant to the, uh, to the Jewish mind, including Jesus. As he grew up, he knew what it was, and he knew what the Passover was uh, foreshadowing. The Old Testament, as we know, are shadows of the New Testament. You want to know something that is deeper, that is uh, in the uh, New Testament? Go back there and you should be able to say, wow, so this is what was happening. The temple, the temple set up, the arrangement of all that. Jesus grew up knowing all those things. And he knew, he knew that uh, he has to come as he grew up. He would be the Passover lamb. It had been made worse by John the Baptist, as he saw him coming for baptism, he said, look, there comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of man. So, so he knew that the hour that had come. At the, at the wedding in Cana, he said, how did you know this woman? Talking of his mother, my time has not come. Towards the end, he talks, there was a time, he talks of a time, 
a time to come. But as we go, as we go closer to this third of April, the year 30, he, now, he has changed the, the way he's speaking. He says, my time has come. So he knew that time had come. He also knew that he had come from God and he had come from God the Father. He also knew where he was going. He knew where he came from. He knew where he was coming. He knew the signs of the times. He knew the times, like those sons of Issachar, and he knew what requires to be done. He also knew that Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, the man who came from Kyrios, and I, I sight and sight about where Kyrios is and who they were. He was actually, he was of a Moabite origin. Simon uh, was the father, and they came from Kyrios. It may be significant, it may not, but he was going to betray him. He also knew that God had put, put all things under his power. He knew he was the Messiah. He was the anointed one. He also knew, and God had always declared, that he had a special relationship with God the Father. He had a special relationship with God the Father. And he knew the work or the working of the other person of the Trinity the Holy Spirit. And that is, I guess, what we have been trying to unravel throughout this year, that without God's presence in our lives, we can do nothing. He also knew, and I guess there are about eight no's or things that he knew, and many more other things that he knew. But by the grace and the, the Holy Spirit, uh, these are the things that he, he, he left telling us that he knew. He knew the disciples needed a lesson to learn of service to God and man. He, he knew that we needed to have a lesson on how to relate down upwards and across, you know? how we could relate to one another. And so we have looked and we've seen uh, that one thing was certain in the, the mind of, uh, John, uh, of John, that, and this we see in 13.1, that having loved his own who were in the world, he wanted to show them his full extent of the love that God the Father and himself had on those whom he had been given by the Father, as demonstrated in that priestly prayer. That's actually the prayer he prayed. The Lord's Prayer was just a teaching lesson. And so um, he says that He wanted to show them what his love was like in a way that went to the very ultimate limit. The love of God, you know, the love of God. In many places, even the song we have sung, uh, you get that sense of the limitlessness of uh, God's uh, love for all of us. He wanted to demonstrate in a way that they would not forget. Just as much as in our, in our, in our sitting down there, we always look for uh, preachers to come up here uh, <laughs> and to demonstrate for us in a way that we cannot forget. In a way that we cannot forget. This was to be a lesson 
an object lesson. And he wanted to tell us that from the time he rendered the heavens and came to join, uh, to be amongst us, that was actually a trauma, a trauma of the ages. He wanted this uh, 11 apostles, if we exclude Judas, because he knew Judas was going to, 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 to leave him. But unfortunately, uh, not even unfortunately, but fortunately, by the grace of God, he gave Judas, he gave Judas the opportunity. He was gracious to Judas. He tried all he good until he told him, now, go and do what you want to do very quickly. And one of the saddest things he said, he walked into the, the night. He left the light in which they were in. He left that fellowship that he was in, walked into the darkness, you know? And sometimes we, we, know, we say, was the grace of God not sufficient <laughs> for Judas? But we know that there was in Judas something that, um, that he had to choose himself and he didn't. You look at him, uh, remember, if there is um, a lesson for all of us that when we are outside the house of God, there is a responsibility that is upon us. He knew that these 12 were chosen by Christ, as we see in Ephesians 1.4. He, he knew that these were bought, purchased, and redeemed, as we see also in Ephesians 5.25. And he, this own, I'm talking of his own, that he had, he had loved. Remember, this, by John 12, the world had actually literally rejected Jesus, the bulk of the world. And so he is now gone into this room where this lesson happened. He had been with them throughout the times, the three years that he was in ministry, but now, he was there, and he knew, we know that this, his own, were effectually, effectually uh, called by God, the Holy Spirit, Second Corinthians 5.17. You know, um, we try to, to picture the the way that that room was like, okay? And um, most of the pictures that we see don't quite reflect um, what that room looked like. First of all, it was uh, something called a triclinium. And it had a triclinium sitting arrangement, I think, um, uh, the, the, we have one picture of that. And uh, the Romans and their culture was something very interesting. They thought that if you want to have your food settle well, if you are eating well, eh, living large, you had to eat with your stomach on the, on the floor, you know. You had to get some cushions, you know. And so um, that's how they were. You, saw th you see those things on the other side and so on. The, that is how they were actually reclining. <laughs> so thank God for the caricatures you, we see about even the greatest uh, artists like uh, Leonardo da Vinci um, and so on. Even the pictures we see about the Pope washing hands uh, and any other practice that we, we see related to this uh, particular occasion. Okay, it is creeping to, to act it out. 
but it is not as a practice of a principle or a theory because when we do that, we only do once in a while. But the lesson that is, uh, is here is supposed to be something that we do every other moment, even when we are down here. So we see that actually the, in, in this particular demonstration, we have Jesus Christ and let us not mince words. As he sits in that uh, demonstration, he actually, as he sits, is demonstrating the fact that he was God. He was God. The other one that we know was there because it is said he had entered Judas's heart was Satan. If you rank in terms of who are the, the main players, and they are the main players in our lives, it is God, the Son, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and this accuser of brethren. He was there and he had done his bit. And at that time, it was appearing like he was successful, isn't it? And then the, the other 11 disciples. So here we have a demonstration of, uh, first of all, Jesus becoming a man. Jesus becoming human. You know, in terms of power, he's the source of power. And if you want to know, how much this power is, just to revisit what happened in Hiroshima in 1945. And the only way in which uh, it was safe to be with the nuclear power was before it was detonated, isn't it? it wa when it was still in the container. So now Jesus had all this power, energy that you can talk of beyond what we can imagine actually is the source, not only, no, it not only having the power, is the source of that power. So we see him now getting up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around him. I want to invite you to imagine that setting was not, that, that setting, you know, it is being acted. He's actually reminding the disciples that this is how it was up there, isn't it? Because he was leaving a seat of honor. He was leaving, he, he's acting actually leaving heaven. As he moves, he's acting leaving heaven. And laying aside his comments, he's leaving aside the glorious strivings that we have. Actually, we can't imagine how it was, how it, how, how it is there. And we can't imagine even now until when we also get the opportunity. If we hold on to the faith that we confess, we'll be there because we'll be in Christ Jesus, just as we are even right now. For those who are his own, are you getting the point? So, see also what he becomes after he has left that seat of honor. He wraps himself with a towel, goes to a corner, picks up the, the person and water, pour, and, and starts to wash um, his um, disciples' feet. For this, we need to, to also realize what, what the, the, this was a physical practice, it was a cultural practice, and it was something that was being practiced actually by the, the well of elites of that time. Those who had emulated the Greek and the Roman uh, style of life. We need to picture uh, out that. 
And then in, that, in those days, uh, it was more or less like our, our setting this way, where we walk. Even if you are walking towards town, not many places are paved. Okay? And so they, they developed as a culture or as a practice, huh? just as it is even in our house, houses. You know, we normally, you go to a house where there is a carpet, you take off your shoes. If, uh, if the guests are so sophisticated, you may get some moccasin shoes which you can put in, you know, so that you, you can uh, prevent your smelly shoes, making the, the visitors uh, uncomfortable. And so um, this is what the, the picture we look at. Remember, also, as it was the last uh, 24 hours, these people had come all along from Petani. You know? They had, they had come all along from Petani, maybe from the house of Mary and Mother. And uh, the, those roads were, were muddy. Or if they were not muddy, if it was not a rainy day, they were dusty. And so they come in into this house, they sit down, they, they recline. I've told you that this reclining was lying low and having your, your feet all that way. And the, and the table where there was nice things, maybe fruits and so on, you know, uh, were, were done that. Remember the three uh, table arrangement that I have mentioned. And so there they were, and they have gone into this place and uh, this food washing was supposed to be done only by servants, not by peers, you know? These, peop these, uh, these people who entertain errors and rudeness, eh? and may I use that word? Stupidity, you know? The, so, <laughs> peers, not only that, it could not be done by a Jew. It was an abomination for a Jew, a Jew born, eh? that son of, a son or a daughter of Abraham, to come and kneel and wash the feet of these 12 plus people. So they were there solicited with their 30 feet and maybe supper is being served and there was something amiss then in that arrangement. In those days, uh, there would be two, two servants, one to serve the, the chief, the, the host, and one to serve the other um, people. But when they came in there, no one of these 12 was willing to, to wash the feet of one another because they were peers, isn't it? They were equals. How can they were equals and they were Jews? Okay, so they couldn't do that. So have you, did you see that picture? That God, Jesus, who is God, had come so low, you know? Uh, one of uh, the, the great writers, one of the theologians, uh, has written about this and tried to give us a picture of what it really was to be incarnate. You know, incarnation, the only people who come to, to, to practicing that is uh, the, uh, our, our Indian colleagues. And they say that if you have been a good person and uh, you die, and you, then you will come back as a cow. You know, that is their, their kind of incarnation. But this one is saying that uh, the second person in the sun, in the, uh, the, seven, the second person who is uh, in God, the son, became human himself. And C.S. Lewis says, he, he was born into the world. And it demonstrates everything. Just imagine the way you, are, you, 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 you have your child, the way they grow, they have height, they have airs, you know, all these kind of things. He even says he was actually a baby. He was conceived and at one time he was a fetus. Maybe at one time he, he actually started as a cell, isn't it? 
those who are biologists, a cell. The only difference, not fertilized by any human action. So he says, if you want to imagine this, how about you turning into a slug? You know a slug, those slime <laughs> into a slug. Or a crab. That is, that is what incarnation was to Jesus. Being a God, but being so lowly. Eh? Not even turning to be an elephant. But a man happens to be one of the smallest uh, human uh, creatures. Eh? When, uh, when the psalmist talked sometimes, he says a worm, like a worm, you know, he compares himself to that. So we have, uh, we have that, uh, that kind of uh, thing that happened. Then he goes now to do the washing, okay? So he has come into the world and he now is in the world. And this is what he's saying. For the time I've been with you and all that, uh, there is something we need to see here. So he started washing the feet of these people. And then he comes to Simon Peter. And we have heard from the reading, the, the, the conversation that went on. Jesus says, after Simon protests, that you cannot do this. This thing that cannot be done by a slave. A slave who is not even a Jew, but a Gentile. You cannot do this, uh, Jesus. And he says, you shall never wash. You shall never wash wash me. You know, you shall not wash. She says, you, you will never wash me. But Jesus tells him, if I don't do this, you will have no part in me. This part, remember the, the prodigal son saying, give me part of my... So he's actually telling them, you will not have any inheritance in the kingdom that I came to establish. Okay? So he says, you shall never wash my feet. Actually, um, I found that in the, in the originals, he, he actually emphasized, Peter was, a, was such a man. He says, never, ever will you wash my feet. With a determination that is final, eh? And yet, they say, they knew Jesus to be Lord. And whoever is Lord, you don't actually respond to him that way. You don't say, uh, maybe for us who, in Kenya, we do not quite get to know what it means to be Lord. Eh? Yeah, but obedience is the most important thing when it comes to dealing with uh, uh, sovereigns, kings, they are lords. But Jesus tells, says, unless I wash you, you'll have no part. You'll not have no part. Then Peter, quick as he is, thinks he has, is getting the lesson, says, not just my feet then. If this is something good that you are doing, wash me all my body, you know? And here is a situation whereby uh, he has not gotten the, the process of salvation. He has not gotten to, to realize that from the day Jesus called them as he walked around and calling the 12, um, we are not all, all of it, but they believed in Jesus Christ. They believed in, in who he was. They believed in what, why he had come. They believed in his mission, his vision. Eh? They even believed in his core values, what it all means. Just like we say here, they believed that they were a community of believers. 
They believed that uh, they were impacting the world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had even been sent on a, if, it was, if they were teachers, they, were, they had been sent on a teaching practice. And they had come and say, yes, this thing works. Yeah? Even demons and devils were uh, re responding to them in a way that they realized, yes, what we are doing is really the work of the kingdom of God. So these were saved people, except one of them. And so Jesus tells them, those who, have, who are saved, they have no need to wash again. Just like when, you know this, where we come from, I, I'm a, oh, basically from uh, this, this side on uh, Kipkabos. It's a very cold place. And uh, you, don't, you don't go to, to, to the river until the sun is up here. And if you are a school going student, you can only do it once a week. <laughs> and during the, when the sun is 90 degrees up, that's when uh, you can go to the bath uh, and wash, you know? And then from there, you have to walk back home. We, so we, from the place where, we were, where, where I went to school, we would do it on a Saturday, on a Sunday evening. Yeah? And then for the rest of the, the week, uh, no, no, no bathing. You just take, if you are lucky, you take uh, water, wash the face, go to school. And uh, so because there used to be inspections, even at school, that whether you have washed the, the, the feet, we would go even when we arrived near the, the, uh, the, the school, we would look for where there is enough dew. And then you, you cheat the teachers, okay, the teachers used to know this one is, is just acting. <laughs> so that is the kind of thing that when you bath, for the rest of the week, you don't have to bath. And then he, after he had finished with this uh, Peter, he goes back, takes the, the things that he had removed and wears them back again. Now, we've reversed to start with sanctification because that's how the, bio, the how it has been structured. And uh, actually the Holy Spirit is such an efficient uh, author so that it doesn't use many words. So let us look at sanctification. What we have seen is that if Jesus, and Jesus alone is the one who sanctifies, what is he commanding us to do as we, we see it later? The key to that is in the questions he asks. The key to understanding this. The key to understanding the, the deeper message of food washing is in the questions he asks. And thank God for the three years he had been going with them. He was a man of using symbols. He used the parables so that you get the picture. He was such an actor. So we see, he asks, do you understand what I have done? Of course they would understand the, the food washing, that's normal. If I, if I asked you, do you understand why I've gone to the, the river, I've washed, and for the next seven days, I don't have to wash until another time. The, the answer is, Huh? Because you fear cold water, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And the other reason is that you have to have your feet clean anyway for the inspection at a primary school. Well, that, that, was, that was that. But so what is this question? Do you understand? 
Do you see the deeper meaning? That is where we say the third that he was trying to, 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 to wash out is using it as a metaphor. He's using it as a, a metaphor, a figure of speech that can, uh, they can use to, to, to grasp. So this third is sin. And so he says, we, we can then say, Jesus, Jesus has claimed, and so we cannot sanctify ourselves, we cannot shed blood for anyone else, we cannot do what he has done. So we, we want to realize that this one now, and this is the practical application, it has to do with our daily work, it has to do with the things we do, it has to do with our working from uh, our homes to the workplace, the way we interact with others, interact with others in a way that involves giving, first of all. Give yourself to them, yeah? You saw him pouring water, it is as if he was pouring his life into the lives of the disciples. Let us pour our lives to one another in, all, in many ways. And uh, I think we don't need to get even the examples here. Um, it would be very easy for you to know what it is. And the other thing is that as we walk up and down, as we travel, you know, we interact with people and Tunakwa Rusana, Sindio. He's saying, forgive one another. And in fact, he says in Matthew 6 14, I think, that if you don't forgive one another, then even the Father who is in heaven will not forgive you of your sins. So that is the practical application of this washing of the feet. But, um, but we get the sense that as, as we talk of washing and cleaning and so on, there must be two types of washing. Wash, washing on Sunday and washing every day. Washing on, on Sunday and washing every day. So we are finished with why, why we wash every day. Imambo ya kukwari sana na kufanya, you know, God wants us to, to do that. And it is actually the greater part of uh, uh, what life is all about. It's about Agnes and Mrs. Korir interacting and in the process, when uh, ingia kwa cha, uh, they go into one uh, chama, and then she refuses to pay, one of them, <laughs> you know. And they have to forgive each other, isn't it? Yes. So that is the practical thing that uh, he's saying. Um, how am I doing? Time-wise? <laughs> OK. So the other one, then, is the washing. Remember, even when we are forgiving one another, it is still if Christ does not come into that relationship and wash us with the word, his word, and so on, without him, we can do nothing. I think after we finished, without him, we can do nothing. It is when we get our, our team for the year. Um, so it is being born again. And these disciples had been born again. It is mandatory that we be born again. It is mandatory that we have this initial put path, uh, you know, uh, in bathing of the whole body. Yeah? It is mandatory. It is a must. So he told uh, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born again from above eh, of the water and the spirit. And so even as we sit here, um, we know now that this um, Judas was not born again. He 
He was not born again. And it's such a dangerous thing for all of us to be in the house of God, go throughout all the rituals, and you are not born again. You know? Yeah, it is like you are sitting in a house that has electricity, that has not been disconnected, but you have never gone to the switch to switch it. That is, that is what uh, it is all about. So he has given us an example. He has given us of what to do. And he's saying, do as I do. Let me quickly say that what he's really saying is that, of course, he cannot, we cannot save anybody. But there is one thing that we can do. Eh? Our mission says making him known through evangelism and discipleship. That's what we can do. We can mentor those who have uh, given themselves uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the example that he demonstrated for, for, for the, the, the disciples. So the physical act was there, but the, the, the disciples had to know about that. So we, it starts with us. It starts with knowing God, for us being disciples, making, known, uh, making God known through um, this kind of mentorship that I've just mentioned. It includes sharing your, our, our faith. You know, you, you share your faith as a Christian, of course, not the faith that we saw at Yakahola here. So ours is making disciples, mentoring, and uh, one of the things is that he, God has always, from the beginning, he has wanted to build a royal priesthood. And so that, that is one other thing that God has given us. Thank you. So, um, so after he had provided the purification and so on, that is how we see him going to sit back. To, to sit down. That is, um, just, uh, that, that is now his ascension, where he is now, and where we are waiting for him to come the second time round. I hope I've done better. Uh, this is not the place where I normally do my things. Um, <laughs> but I thank God I've given you a different edition. Thank you, and God bless you. Amen.